So I manage the collections at the Natural History Museum in London, the beetle collections. And, and we have one of the largest and most comprehensive collections of beetles anywhere in the world. So we've got about 22,000 drawers and about 200,000 different species of beetle represented, which is about 30, 40% of described biodiversity, maybe slightly more. You have centuries of human lifetimes have been poured into building this collection. And we live on a very biodiverse planet. There are hundreds of species, thousands of species all around us. And for us to not be interested in the other organisms that share the planet with us would be extraordinary. I, I think that it's part of the human condition to, to want to know, to want to discover. I think the process of discovery is something which is fundamentally human. We have this archive of biodiversity. And of course, tragically, a lot of the tropical forests are being cut down, a lot of the environment where these things live is being altered. So one can envisage a time in the future when collections like this are where you can go to see biodiversity. It's like making a fossil record, except we can actually influence what goes into the fossil record. Instead of, if you look at the Jurassic fossil record, it's an entirely random process of what gets preserved and what doesn't. But I, I feel that if we're in the face of a, of a massive extinction, which appears to be the case, we're at least keeping representatives of the Earth's biodiversity all in one place. You can come from anywhere in the world, you can come and look at a collection like ours, and you can see different solutions to evolutionary problems, the results of different evolutionary pathways. You can see the relationships between the organisms, you can see them all lined up together in one place. And that combined information is a very, very powerful tool for answering all kinds of questions, and questions that we don't even know yet, as well as questions that we don't even know we want to ask. And one of the things that we're doing with the collection at the moment is we're digitizing it and making it available online. And most collections all over the world are doing this now. This is, this is the way collections are going, is that we want to make them available. Now, from a practical point of view, this is very important because you've got people in, in countries which can't afford to come to London. London's a very expensive city. It's a long way away from most of the most biodiverse places. And it means that people in those countries can get on the internet, as long as they've got an internet connection, and they can see any types that were collected from their country. They can see a, a good snapshot of their biodiversity. They can identify their specimens by comparison with real photographs, things like that. So there's that purely practical point of view. But it's also the fact that every specimen has got labels on it saying who collected it, when it was collected, what it was doing. And there are 10 million beetles in our collection, probably 8 to 10 million beetles. So and every one of those has got a label, and every label's got four or five lines of text. So there's nobody living who's read all those labels. I mean, I've probably spent more time looking at that collection than anybody else alive, um, or at least anybody else who's still working. And I haven't read probably 2% of the labels that are in the collection. So if we're getting them digitized, getting them online, sticking that information out there, people are going to find things that they don't know is there. We found an Alfred Russell Wallace specimen, collected by the great evolutionist Alfred Russell Wallace, and labeled by him. And he's cut up old letters. And there are specimens where there are stamps. Uh, some of these Victorian stamps would be quite valuable if they hadn't been cut up by Alfred Russell Wallace to use his labels. But also, we have a letter which we think could be uh, written by Charles Darwin to Wallace, which Wallace has cut up and used for labeling specimens. So, you know, you, you wouldn't find something like that unless you started looking at the data. Uh, that's not even a scientific question. That's a, a cultural, artistic question, but it's still very interesting. When you've got a collection of this magnitude, you can ask other questions than scientific as well. You can ask these cultural questions, you can look at uh, the circumstances of some of the collectors, some of these people are living in, in, in habitat. You know, you've got people using cactus thorns to uh, pit the specimens, you've got people pointing tiny beetles on strands of human hair. You've got very strange uh, and interesting things in the collection, aside from its immense scientific value. One of the questions we always ask is, why do we have this collection? And you often ask this by politicians, by people who've got money, by people who are providing the funding, uh, or uh, by senior management. And it's very tempting to just give sound by answers and to say, yeah, yeah, we have the collection because you can study patterns of climate change by looking at the dates in which short-lived insects were collected. And that's an interesting study, and definitely you can do that. Or you say, well, these are vectors of disease, these are agricultural pests, we need this for food security, we need this for human safety and human health. But if you excessively justify the collection in those terms, you run the risk of 
making other parts of the collection seem irrelevant to those people. I think that's a very, very great risk. I mean, the collection is useful because it's comprehensive, because it contains as many different taxa as possible. It's as good a snapshot of the biodiversity of the world as we have been able to assemble in 200 years or 300 years of doing this. You can say, well, these particular specimens that have got good time series data, or these particular specimens that are pests, or these particular specimens that are disease vectors, are the important ones. But you are implying when you do that that the other specimens are somehow less important. I mean, I think there's just a grave danger in that, I think, that um, because you're, 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 you're picking particular specimens that are relevant to particular current problems of this generation and giving those some special significance. And one of the things about a collection is that it needs to be developed more or less evenly. Uh, you get situations often where you get a, a curator who's a specialist in one group, and the collection gets really, really well developed in that group, and the rest of it goes to hell in the handbasket. And you get situations where you get management saying, this thing is important, that thing is important, and this inference that the rest of it is not important. And then you get the collection developing unevenly. Whereas actually, you want it to be as representative a sample of biodiversity as you can get, because that's where its real use is and its real cultural value is. And one of the things I've been thinking about lately is looking at art museums, looking at national monuments. We don't justify those in utilitarian terms. You don't look at Michelangelo's David and say, oh, look, this tells you about human physiology in the early 1500s. You don't, you know, look at Mount Rushmore and say, oh, that's interesting, because we know when that was carved. And we can look at the rates of erosion, we can look at the pollution. We can see whether you know there's been acidic rain damage to the, the the stone surfaces. We don't do that. We say this is Mount Rushmore. This is cool. This is Michelangelo's David. This is really beautiful. And we understand that these things have an intrinsic cultural value. We don't need to justify them in, in financial and economical and entirely utilitarian terms. And somehow, entomological collections, natural history collections in general, have missed that boat. We don't seem to be able to feel confident justifying our collections in intrinsic terms. This is humanity's best attempt to represent the biodiversity of the planet on which we live, the other organisms which share the planet on which we live. And this is surprising because the cultural questions that have been answered by a collection like this are enormous. If you look, for example, at the fact that Darwin and Wallace were both young amateurs who liked collecting beetles. And because beetles are a very, very diverse group, they saw a picture of the world that was very detailed because they were looking at these beetles. And they both started thinking about the reasons for the detail, the reasons for the variation. And this led them to a mechanism that helped explain the diversity of life on Earth and ultimately helped explain why we're here and gave us the best answer to why we have a human species, why we have the diversity of life that we see around us. So this is a massive philosophical breakthrough. And this is on the basis of insect collecting by a couple of amateur guys in the middle of the 1800s. And I think that we should be capitalizing on that as well as the easy answers of climate change, food security, diseases. We need to capitalize on the massive cultural benefits that can come out of natural history collections and out of natural history collecting. And very often, with the whole of science, it's an iterative process. You get something like the splitting of the atom, something like Marie Curie discovering radium, something like Gregor Mendel and um, inheritance genetics. And at the time when those are discovered, their immediate application is not obvious. It might be 10, 20 years, it might be a generation before those things actually inform our daily lives. And insect collections are the same. And I think that there are questions that can be answered from insect collections that we haven't even started to ask yet. But also there are massive questions that have already been answered from insect collections. And I don't want us to oversimplify this. I don't want this collection to be described as if it was a tool to serve a particular problem that we're dealing with today. I think that's a cop out. I think that if you were to ask the academics of the last generation and say, why do we have this collection? They'd say, oh, it's for the glory of God, or it's for the good of the, uh, the glory of the king, or the glory of the country, or something like that. And nowadays, we're not satisfied with those justifications. And I think our great-great-grandchildren will not be satisfied with the glib justifications that we have today. We have to go for a deeper and more thorough and more rounded justification of why we have these collections.